Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto, here with my great friend and America's primary care physician, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Paul, how are you doing? <laughs> a little, a little English on my name there. I, I liked it. I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good because we're about to talk about some some pearls on common ear complaints from episode number 413 of The Curbsiders with Dr. Angela Peng. And Paul, you know, I, I think as primary care, we're all very comfortable taking a history. So with the ear, you just want to ask about prior infections. You know, are they sticking anything in the ear? Have they had prior surgeries? What and bar and risk for barrow trauma, which would be like jumping in a pool. Are they flying all the time? Have they been scuba diving recently? Those are just some of the things you might ask for. On the exam, Paul, because we're going to spend most of the time talking about management, but I did want to talk about the exam. Am I good? If someone comes with ear pain, should I just look in the ear and, and we're good to go? Well, I, I mean, as per usual, Matt, no. But I mean, it's the ear is tricky. I feel like a lot of, especially learners, are terrified of the ears themselves. So yes, you're looking in both the ears. That's a great place to start for someone who has ear pain and looking in the unaffected ear first, just for a basis of comparison. I feel like we all know that kind of stuff. But I think, Matt, the larger point that you're making is that, I don't know, like the plumbing up here is just very complicated and not all ear pain is coming from the ears. It can certainly be referred jaw pain. There can be TMJ uh, dysfunction. There can be, God, based the tongue malignancy, I think that came up as I mentioned, there's just lots of things that can refer to the ear. So don't don't stop if you look in the ear and don't see any cause of etiology because there's lots of stuff in the head, neck, palpate your, palpate your, your lymph nodes and, and really do a thorough head exam because uh, lots of stuff can actually cause ear pain in and above the ear itself. Yeah, I look in the ear. I look in the nose uh, with the specula. I'm looking for you know what's going on in there. I look in the mouth and throat as well. And and like you said, palpating for for lymph nodes. You don't want to miss like a malignancy or something. So yeah, definitely look at that. Maybe you can throw in some allergy testing if there's a lot of like sinus you know allergy type symptoms going on. And then CAT scan based on clinical suspicion. But that's usually not something I'm doing at a first visit. Now let's go on to management, Paul. So sinonasal symptoms can be referred to the ear a lot. So you really want to make sure that you you tackle those. And all the ENT doctors that we've talked to and all the notes I get back from ENT doctors in practice are all like, patients should be doing saline irrigation. So the high volume, either the neti pot or the squeeze bottle um, and, and using distilled water with or, or making your own formulation at home with you know, it, like the salt in there so that it doesn't burn the heck out of your nose when you use it. And I've actually, you know, th those work very well. So I, I think most patients with sinus symptoms should have those. And then Paul, for something like an otitis media, she mentioned, you know, yes, antibiotics, but did she, what else did she say might might be helpful in treating those patients? Yeah, it's, it's. I, I loved it. She made a point about sort of the adjunctive therapy that you would actually expect. So things like intranasal steroids and also like the, your second generation antihistamines are a good way to kind of clear out the plumbing again, sort of make sure that all the tubes are flowing the way they're supposed to flow, in addition to the systemic um, antimicrobial therapy that you'd be giving for it. She did make the point that for otitis media specifically, the drops aren't going to be all that helpful, you know, with the exception that if there's a really irritated TM, she might give a, a topical medication, but I feel like that's maybe above my level of comfort. For the most part, the sort of adjunctive <laughs> stuff that we have a lot of comfort with, uh, the steroids, uh, intranasal steroids and the antihistamines are things that we should be prescribing along with their antimicrobial therapy. Yeah, and she mentioned sometimes she'll even do like topical uh, in antihistamine like azelastine and uh, maybe even oral oral steroids if the person's really, you know, maybe if they've tried some of these other things already and they're really congested, inflamed, whatever, she might do oral steroids. I think it's always reasonable if you've tried some of these first line things, you know, the the nasal steroids, the saline irrigation, they're not getting better adult. I always refer to because, you know, at some point you need someone to take a deeper look in there and, and sometimes patients are going to need a surgical procedure to help out. Yeah, they're in there boring out the eustachian too with balloon dilations <laughs> near the carotid artery. It's just stuff stuff that's on my pay grade. Yeah, we, we should mention the same kind of stuff we're talking about here really attacking the the sinus symptoms, the allergy symptoms for, for someone that you think has eustachian tube dysfunction, but it was just kind of like vague, some of this vague ear ear discomfort that, that you know, doesn't seem to be an ear infection, like a otitis uh, media or otitis externa, eustachian tube dysfunction could be what it is. And, and these kind of things we're talking about work for that too. Um, Paul, otitis externa, she mentioned you can prevent this by mixing a one-to-one -one solution of rubbing alcohol and distilled vinegar, and you can just put a few drops in. You know, let's say you're a swimmer and you're you're getting swimmer's ear, 
you can use that afterwards as like a prophylactic uh, measure afterwards, which is, you know, a lot of people have that kind of stuff hanging around their house. It's a neat tip. Yeah. It, and this is not like a huge ear lavage. She didn't make the point. It's just a couple of drops. Like you're not washing yes. the whole thing out. Yeah. Use distilled white vinegar. Don't use like balsamic <laughs> vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> and then Paul, have you ever had the problem with the pricing of these fluoroquinolone slash dexamethasone drops? And did she have a tip for that? I mean, I, I don't feel a thing. My patients, um, yeah, have struggled with, <laughs> with the cost. Yeah, no, it's a great point. But she made the point that you can use the the ophthalmic drops um, instead uh, if they're covered by insurance. And then also you can separate out your ingredients. So often these come in like a topical fluoroquinolone combined with a topical steroid. And if you get them separately, it might be a little bit cheaper. Or you can use the ophthalmologic. So you can use, she made the point, you can use eye drops in ears, but you can't use ear drops in eyes, which I thought was a yeah, <laughs> a really helpful framework. Right. Yeah. Because the, the eye drops are like pH balance and s- sterile so that you can you can drop them in the eye and not have burning or damage. So, of course, you can put them in your ear, which is a less sensitive area. Um, she did mention that like if someone has a perforated eardrum, like TM, then uh, you wouldn't want to use just the yeah. over-the-counter drops in the ear. But if, they, if it's an otic or ophthalmic formulation, like prescription formulation, then it would be okay to use it if indicated. Um, she told us, Paul, I don't know if you remember this, she has a large Q-tip in her office that says, do not use. So tell your patients not to use Q-tips. If they have wax in their ears, uh, she recommends a couple drops of mineral oil, which you can do either weekly if you're just trying to prevent wax buildup, or if someone's got like some cerumen that's impacted, they can do it like every other day and come back to the office in a week or two. It'll make the clean out much easier, or it might even just spontaneously come out like just with that. It might kind of just like slide it out of there. So I thought that was pretty cool. I, I had not... Uh, that had not been something I'd heard. What about, uh, Paul, what about uh, tap water or peroxide? I know a lot of people use like to use that to flush out ears. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised. There, There is not wild enthusiasm for the ceruminolytics, which apparently just soak in the cerumen and cause it to expand, which, which feels like a problem. And the t- even the water can be not great sometimes because apparently you can get behind the cerumen and, and then just cause an otitis externa, which is also not what you want. So <laughs> yeah, it sounds like we should not be just irrigating willy-nilly uh, unless we're really sure what we're doing that we can actually get this stuff out of there. So it, this might be right as much as fun as it is to do. This might be something that leaves the experts if you can't get it done with mineral oil. Yeah. So if you put a, if you put a ton of water in there, make sure you get the wax out and the water out. <laughs> Don't send them home with like <laughs> a bunch of water still sloshing around behind the wax. Um, and then finally, <laughs> Paul, what if somebody has really itchy ears? That that actually comes up a lot in primary care. What what do we could what do we do for that? Yeah, so she mentioned she likes the fluocinolone oil, I believe, which in addition to having the anti-inflammatory benefits of the topical steroid, the oil kind of moisturizes things and keeps it sort of nice and supple. So especially for what is not really otitis externa, but was probably uh, eczema, like this can be actually a really helpful agent to kind of calm things down and keep people from sticking things in their ears in the first place. Yeah, so fluocinolone oil. I hadn't, I didn't even know that existed. Mm-hmm. I, I've had some success with triamcinolone ointment as well. I, you yeah. know, I think it's a similar thing. It's, it's kind of, I guess when they put it in their ear, it probably melts down a little bit and, and drips in there. So that's, that works as well. And uh, yeah, just so many great tips on this episode. So if you want to hear the full thing, click on the link in the transcript. And until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Otto, and this has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. And I've been Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. <laughs> <laughs> uh thank you and good night. Great. <laughs>